You may be familiar with the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which basically means exactly what it says. And when it came to planning his era of Doctor Who, it's clear new showrunner Stephen Moffat wanted to follow this advice. Indeed, his predecessor Russell T Davis had established a tradition of making an early episode of each series, a trip into the past often including a significant historical figure. After a family trip to the Cabinet War Rooms, Moffat asked close friend Mark Gatiss to write a story about Winston Churchill and the Daleks, which Gatiss was keen to do because the iconic monsters were inspired by the Nazis back when they were first created in 1963. The pair of writers also wanted to use this story as a way to redesign the Daleks as bigger and more menacing, including colours harkening back to the 60s Peter Cushion movie. All of this came together to form Series 5's Victory of the Daleks, where the famous monsters return in the middle of the London Blitz, disguised as human-made Ironsides. However, this episode has always been a bit controversial and disliked within the fanbase for a number of reasons, especially the so-called Paradigm Daleks and the writing of Churchill himself. So, bust out your bag of Dalek brand Skittles and prepare for war, because it's time to review Victory of the Daleks. What are you doing here? I am your soldier! I have always loved the World War II setting in media. It was such a big conflict that there's so much to delve into when it comes to a story set during that period. You get the rapid advancements in technology, the occupied countries, air raids, and so much more. There's simply a wealth of narrative potential, and even the pure aesthetics and atmosphere of such a setting are always fascinating and instantly recognisable. When something is set in World War II, you can usually tell within the first few seconds, and Victory of the Daleks is no exception. Beginning with a frantic war room where the Air Force are desperately trying to coordinate, it feels very authentic, perfectly capturing the frenzy and stress these officers and analysts would constantly be under. From the code phrases to the battle map, it all feels so real, like an accurate window into a real day in central London during the Blitz. So I think the cold open does a fantastic job setting the tone and atmosphere of the story. It immediately sets itself apart from the earlier Empty Child two-parter, because there's more of a focus on the actual war, rather than that previous story, which was more of a regular Doctor Who horror story that simply took place during World War II. And when it comes to World War II iconography, you can't get any more recognisable than Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Or as you might know him, that guy that Churchill Insurance Dog was inspired by. Since 2005, Doctor Who has had the recurring episode format known as Celebrity Historicals. Episodes where the Doctor and companions come across famous faces from history and have wild and wacky adventures. With a cool tradition like this, you're bound to get some weird, one-dimensional characterisations here and there. With the figures being presented as a postcard version of themselves, as the general public tends to see them. Indeed, the most clear-cut example of this in Doctor Who is Churchill, whose presence in this episode has always been a bit controversial for some fans. There's no denying he is one of the most famous wartime figures thanks to his role in the resolute defence of Britain and liberation of France against all lots. He's pretty much the most well-known British Prime Minister in history. However, when you take into account the tangled web of his political ideologies, it becomes hard to imagine why the Doctor would ever want to be best friends with such a controversial warmongering figure who goes against basically everything the Time Lord stands for. Even during his time in office, Churchill was a divisive politician for his very conservative and anti-socialist beliefs, along with his aggressive support for the British Empire to the extent he claimed native races couldn't develop without imperial guidance. Even though he lobbied for something like the EU long before it was created, it's safe to say Winston Churchill is the kind of politician who conflicts with the beliefs of the majority of Doctor Who fans. His inclusion with this episode does make sense for the narrative, and Ian McNeese is absolutely incredible, really bringing the character to life, but there's a writing nuance that's sorely lacking. Churchill feels like a postcard especially because he never takes a cigar out of his mouth. He's the bare bones, romanticised public view of the leader only ever talking in catchphrases. It shies away from any kind of political controversy, although ironically, this in turn has made it controversial, which is just a bit funny to me. It turns out Churchill has a secret weapon in the form of Daleks. Sorry, Iron Size, which destroyed an entire squadron of Yunker U-87s. This is an incredible reveal and I love the Doctor's reaction. The last time we saw Daleks, it was at the end of Series 4, where they were trying to destroy all of reality itself, only to be genocided by the Metacrisis Doctor. They all died. That was it. But here they are again, and in their most unlikely form yet. It's a really good twist, and you can feel the Doctor's anger underneath. The Iron Psy concepts were inspired by the acclaimed power of the Daleks from all the way back in 1966, so it's a really interesting route to take the villains in the modern era, seemingly just willing to serve the Allies without any ulterior motive. The 
episode repeatedly claims that these are just Ironsides created by Professor Bracewell and nothing more. They even have propaganda posters, like this one. The outlandishness of it all is what makes it memorable because it's so jarring to see. They're rolling around carrying folders and tea, so it just looks and sounds wrong, but in a brilliant way. Would you care for some tea? It creates a feeling of tension as you sit there just waiting for something to snap, for the true plan to be revealed, so there's a wonderfully intense atmosphere to their existence as Ironsides. There are also shades of Blood of the Daleks, this idea that the monsters can be created and used for human purposes, so it really is a refreshing use of them in the modern era. I just wish it made this a longer part of the narrative, since it only lasts for about 10 minutes before the real plan is revealed and then the Power Rangers Daleks show up to restore the status quo, but we'll get to that mess in a bit. You are everything I despise. One of the main parts of the 11th hour was the Doctor being late with the TARDIS, and that continues in Victory of the Daleks, as the Doctor shows up a month after Churchill called him at the end of Beast Below. I like this aspect, since it means the Doctor inadvertently allowed all this to happen. He would have been able to prevent the Daleks from being integrated in the military, but now he has to fight an uphill battle convincing Churchill to drop the Ironsides before they can actually cause any trouble. It's this kind of moment where the postcard writing of Churchill actually does make sense. He was an obsessive warmonger, which is shown by him trying to take the TARDIS for military use, so you would expect him to latch onto the Ironsides and refuse to let go because their power would guarantee victory. He doesn't care if they're aliens or not, because he sees their lasers go zap and the German planes go boom, so he's locked into stubborn tunnel vision by this point. Even Amy can't help the Doctor please his case because she doesn't know about the Daleks. I really love this brief moment and what it represents to the wider story arc. Throughout the Russell T Davis era, stories had real, in-universe consequences. Big Ben and Downing Street needed to be rebuilt. Torchwood's fall led to the technology appearing in other people's hands. And lastly, Dalek invasions were linked through characters and people remembering events, especially the Stolen Earth, with planets in the sky and characters like Adelaide having encounters with the invaders. However, Amy on the other hand has absolutely no recollection of this big, massive invasion, which seems impossible to both the Doctor and the viewer. Everyone experienced the Dalek occupation of Earth, it's just not something anyone could forget, since the entire planet was almost destroyed. It's not even like Donna in Runaway Bride, who was snorkeling in Spain during Doomsday so he didn't see all the Cybermen. No, there's clearly something more going on here. So the episode lingering on this conversation and using the crack light motif makes it important to the wider series, since it's the first major example of the cracks in time erasing things from Amy's mind, with the visual of the crack at the end further driving that point home. I spoke about the tension bubbling as the Doctor had to keep watching his mortal enemies wheel around the heart of London's defence against the Luftwaffe, and this tension comes to a boiling point as he snaps and confronts the so-called Ironsides. I adore this scene. Remember, the Daleks have taken everything from him. They've taken his people, his companions, his planet, and they somehow keep coming back, always surviving no matter the odds. In Classic Who, they were simply a recurring villain, a popular fan favourite monster they could trial every couple of years. However, because New Who has a more modern and dramatic tone, the monsters have a more consistent presence justifying the Doctor's growing hatred for them. You get the sense that each time they appear, the Doctor gets angrier and more volatile because of everything they've lost. So it really does make sense that the Doctor would snap here. It's a brilliant scene for driving home just how much he despises these creatures for everything they've done. He knows there's no such thing as a good dog. So this moment further cements Matt Smith as a suitable successor to David Tennant, whose incarnation was always very shouty and emotional like this. It's also very clever that this outburst is what actually sets the Dalek plan into motion, because they use his testimony to activate their progenitor and unleash the Paradigm Daleks. Even though I think it's a bit weird and silly that this is how they bring their entire race back, it's a great twist that shows how they've grown as a threat, developing new tactics and making the Doctor walk right into a trap without even knowing it. It reminds me a bit of one of Davis's original plans for Doomsday, which was for the Cock Scurry to have targeted 21st century London as it was the most likely place to come across the Doctor or his associates so he could open the Genesis arc for them. This is kind of a similar premise. Set yourself up in a period of history where you'll be noticed and wait for the Doctor to show up, before using this predictability against him. It's a genius plan and it even stuns the Doctor himself. I was that plan. So I know this isn't exactly an original observation, but I absolutely hate the Dalek ship in this episode. In the Davis era they had a distinct look to them, a design that carried through from series 1 to series 4. It was moody and alien, perfectly fit in the tone of the show and the monster itself, but in this it's just an industrial kitchen? 
This is supposed to be a Dalek ship from the Series 4 finale, but it looks nothing like the others and is just a barren metal room. And sure you could claim that this is a different part of the ship, but the design is so far detached from the other look that it wouldn't even make sense as a different section. It looks pitiful, empty, and not at all sinister or suitable for the climactic confrontation between Doctor and Dalek. But hey, look at the Jammy Dodger, not the Dalek kitchen and destroy all human space beam. It also turns out that the progenitor devices contain pure Dalek DNA, with all but one having been destroyed. Huh, handy that. It's an annoying plot contrivance, but I do like that the progenitor wouldn't otherwise recognise these Daleks. This is consistent with the Davis characterization of the monsters. Very few Daleks in his era were the same that fought in the Time War. Most of them were created afterwards out of humans or Davros, so they were impure as a result. This story acknowledges that, making it impossible for the survivors to create new Daleks because the species is so hellbent on purity. It's a good, imaginative way to bridge the gap between old and new, but I really don't like that the only solution for opening the progenitor was the Doctor strolling in and saying, Oh look, you're a Dalek. I just find that a bit silly. The progenitor stuff all builds up to the huge, dramatic and shocking reveal of multicoloured smarty Daleks. These paradigm Daleks have always been the most criticised part of this episode, and for very good reason. The episode treats them like a huge deal, even killing off the impure Ironsides. But look at them. They're so bulky and unwieldy with massive arses, and the white one is so close to the ceiling light that the framing is super cramped. I understand this bigger design was supposed to make the props easier to pilot, but they look so goofy and the colours accentuate that. They're very bright and matte, rather than being the more metallic and duller look that later revisions would have. And look, I respect the wish to reinvent the monster to make them scarier and more unique to the era, but the Paradigm Daleks are one of the worst ways to do it, because they don't fit the serious tone of the story in the slightest. The eye stalks and deeper voices are cool, but everything about them makes them look like they're the early learning centre Daleks for ages three and up, rather than the bronze design which maintained the core elements of the originals while stop dating them for the modern era. There's nothing inherently wrong with a radical redesign, but chonky Daleks with bright colours for different roles are definitely one of the worst possible ways to go, besides those awful spider designs for the early versions of the TV movie. Those are just unforgivable. Even though the paradigm designs are the magnet for most people's criticisms, my main issue with the Daleks in this episode is that it comes so soon after the series 4 finale. The Davies era had already pushed the supposed final destruction of the villains a bit far, because there were two different stories falsely claiming to wipe them out for good, but victory of the Daleks retroactively makes that three. Since they survived the Metacrisis Doctor's shocking genocide, the weight of that plot point is undermined and it just feels unsatisfying. The monsters should have been rested for one series at the very least, if only to continue selling the fact that Journey's End was the climactic ending of the fierce war defining the Davis era. Them returning already makes that entire finale feel pointless, like bringing the monsters back immediately after evil of the Daleks, when they were also destroyed for good. That's why them simply being here annoys me, because it does harm to previous stories with a soft recon of their off-screen survival. Obviously Daleks are an iconic part of Doctor Who and you can't ever truly kill them off, because people will always want them back, so it was inevitable they were going to return after Journey's End. But to do so immediately after that story feels cheap, especially in a pretty anticlimactic episode so early in the following series. It squanders their big return, which will always take points of this episode, since it probably should have been used in series 6 instead, so I will always hold it against Moffat for commissioning Gators to bring back the Daleks so soon after the change in showrunner. The of the I've spoken a lot about Daleks, for obvious reasons, but let's take a quick diversion to talk about some of the humans in this episode. Well, a human and an android to be specific. I think Professor Bracewell is a great part of this episode. He is supposedly the inventor of the Iron Sights, along with having a bunch of other ideas impossible for this time period. Since we as the viewers are familiar with the Daleks, we have a similar reaction to the Doctor immediately jumping to being suspicious of the Professor. We don't know if he's a genuine scientist being manipulated by the Daleks, 
or if he's secretly some evil mastermind working with them to conquer the planet like we've seen so many other times before, with characters like Miss Hartigan. Although unlike Miss Hartigan, I would rather not be stepped on by Bracewell. However, it actually turns out he was a robot created by the Daleks rather than the other way around, which I think is a wonderful piece of subversion. Gatiss also does a good job of giving Bracewell an actual character, since he has to come to terms with his true nature as an android. It reminds me a lot of characters like Jackson Lake and John Smith, this man who has just had his entire life uprooted and pulled from out underneath him. He's a very human presence with his battle for identity becoming a solid, albeit underexplored B-plot for the episode. And speaking of human presences, Amy has handled a lot better than she was in The Beast Below, where it felt like she was only there for convenient plot developments that seemed out of character. In Victory of the Daleks, however, she's a little bit more proactive, realising Bracewell can be used to fight back against his Dalek creators. Indeed, the android came up with a bubble technology, which the planets used to send Spitfires into space. And yes, Mr. Trivia Commenter, I already know Danny Boy's Mark Gators himself. I won't deny this scene looks great visually, but it feels a little bit shark jumpy, like Doctor Who trying to do Star Wars. It's memorable for what it is and Doctor Who does this kind of silly stuff all the time, but I think the sequence just goes a little bit too far, even if it does feel triumphant as the dish is destroyed and London is plunged back into helpful darkness once again. However, because the Daleks are very clever, they have a backup plan in the form of Bracewell, who has a big old bomb in his chest. You know, as you do. As far as last ditch self-destruct bombs go, it's a pretty significant one. This leads to a crisis of confidence within the Doctor. He is again faced with an impossible decision, like the character so often is. He could destroy the Daleks once and for all, for about the tenth time. Or he could protect Earth, but let them slip away. It's an incredibly difficult dilemma, harkening back to Parting of the Ways, where the Ninth Doctor could have detonated the Delta Wave to destroy his old enemy at the cost of every human life in the solar system. And even before that, the War Doctor sacrificed all of Gallifrey to stop the Daleks. So every time the Ninth, Tenth and Eleventh Doctors see the monster, they're reminded of the atrocity they can which didn't even work. It adds a lot of stakes to the narrative, since if the Doctor presses this attack and destroys the Dalek ship, it would come at the cost of Amy and everyone on the planet below. He would once again be trading an entire planet, billions of lives lost for the Doctor's war. So it's a very dark moment punctuated by the character actually considering it because of everything the Daleks have already taken from him. It's honestly the perfect play by the films, the ultimate final card to trap their eternal foe, because they know the Doctor would never choose that path again. It's so out of the Doctor's character that it's basically impossible. Even if from the specific Daleks' perspective, they should probably be more scared of him because the last time they saw him, he literally genocided their entire race. And come on, there's no way they knew that was the Metacrisis Doctor and not the actual one. So I guess that's a little bit of a plot hole there. Instead of some big final confrontation, the actual climax of the episode is the Doctor trying to defuse the Oblivion Continuum. I am in two minds about Bracewell's humanity and emotion being the way to stop the bomb. On one hand, it's a great way to prove he's just as human as everyone else, but on the other hand, it feels way too Moffat era. Saving the day through the power of love. It feels like a cheap and disappointing resolution. The Daleks just zoom away and Bracewell saves the world because he has a crush. It's frustrating. However, it is good that there's an extensive epilogue, including the Doctor reflecting on his loss. The Daleks have escaped, complete with a progenitor allowing them to grow at an unstoppable rate. This is the equivalent of the entire Genesis arc slipping out of the Doctor's reach. The implications are massive, so it's understandable that he would feel like he's failed. But this scene is also why human companions are so important. Thanks to Amy, the Doctor can see that he hasn't completely failed. She represents all the lives he saved, because at the end of the day, that's what the Doctor is supposed to do, rather than killing. Sure, they usually have to kill to save lives, but the significance is that saving lives is always a priority. Besides, he can always track down and stop the Paradigm Daleks at another point, but if the Earth had been destroyed, it would have been permanent. So he did make the right choice at the end of the day. It's another good use of Amy and shows the human touch she brings to the show, along with punctuating a triumphant ending, especially as she and the Doctor allow Bracewell to live. It's a sweet scene that further proves Matt Smith is capable of filling David Tennant's big shoes, and it shows a real understanding of the Doctor's love for humanity, not allowing his hatred of the Daleks to extend to Bracewell, despite him being created by the monsters. So it's a touching note to end the episode on. Thank you, thank you Doctor.
Victory of the Daleks is a bit of a tricky one. The first 10 minutes is one of the best Dalek narratives of the modern era, but the rest of the episode is very underwhelming. It's a brilliant setup with a striking Ironside designs and ongoing tension, but the concept of the Daleks within the British Army being controlled by Churchill is woefully underutilised. Churchill himself isn't characterised very extensively and doesn't have much depth as a subject of a celebrity historical, because he feels like he's just a paper thin, idealised representation. That being said, the Doctor is incredible and Smith has some truly standout moments, like his outburst in front of the Ironsides. The episode really makes you understand the Doctor's long and bloodied history of the Daleks. Amy is also handled better than she was in The Beast Below, but she still only really exists as someone for the Doctor to spout exposition at. I would rank Victory of the Daleks at a C on the Series 5 tier list. It's definitely one of Gatiss' better Doctor episodes, probably only below Sleep No More and Night Terrors in my opinion, but the pacing is a bit bumpy with the story just kind of wrapping up without the big explosive climax viewers had come to expect from modern Dalek stories. Bracewell's story gives the narrative a good human core, and the World War II setting is realised perfectly, with a wonderful authenticity and atmosphere, but everything the episode does right is counterbalanced by the horrible Paradigm Daleks, which definitely deserve the endless mockery they continue to receive to this day. And also the Daleks are pretty much just pointless in this episode as a whole, given that it basically undoes the entire Series 4 finale. At the end of the day, Victory of the Daleks can simply be summed up as wasted potential. Rather than ushering in a new Dalek era, it just doesn't hit the right notes and becomes defined by its failures above all else. But hey, at least it's still better than most of Series 5. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my Platinum level patron Fallon Cortez, and all my Gold level patrons, Alex Marston, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Francois AK Line Vortex, George, Herna Verzog, and Stefan Evermiller. Miller. Thank you so much for your support.